Welcome to Intergenerational Politics, a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Shi, a freshman at UCLA, the youngest elected delegate for Joe Biden, and also co-hosts this podcast with Jill. And I'm Jill Winebanks, the author of The Watergate Girl, which is coming out in paperback on March 1st. So I hope that you will all go out and get a copy in paperback um, and hopefully enjoy the read. I'm also an MSNBC legal analyst and am quite busy this week because of the second impeachment trial, which started on Tuesday, February 9th. Throughout the course of the afternoon of the first day of the new trial, House impeachment managers presented a clear and convincing case, not only for why it's constitutional for the Senate to try former President Trump, who was impeached while he was still in office, but also why senators should vote to convict him on the facts for inciting an insurrection against the US government and trying to prevent the peaceful transfer of power as our constitution provides. I was moved by the House um, Chief Manager, Jamie Raskin's presentation, and I was enthralled by the other House managers' presentations, especially Representative Ngozi. On the other hand, Trump's lawyers have come in for quite a bit of criticism. Um, they presented an argument that many on Twitter called a word salad. It was meandering and it made no sense. Even Republican allies of the president said to reporters that the defense was incoherent and ineffective and that they were very disappointed. And there are reports that the president, former president is equally disappointed. Um, the allies of the former president also said that the House managers were brilliant, organized, and persuasive on the law, on fact, and emotion. We are thrilled to have with us one of the jurors from the first day of the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump, Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. We can't wait to hear his thoughts on that first day and the stakes of the trial. Um, Senator Blumenthal was elected in 2011 and currently serves on a number of important committees, including Veterans Affairs, Armed Services, and Judiciary. Uh, Senator Blumenthal also served as Connecticut's Attorney General, U.S. Attorney for Connecticut, law clerk to former Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman, and also graduated from Yale Law School. Good morning, Senator Blumenthal, and thank you so much for being here. I'm delighted to be with you, Jill and Victor. Thank you so much for having me. Yesterday, we heard House impeachment manager Jamie Raskin start his opening statement by saying that the evidence will be based on cold, hard facts. He then went on to what I think was some of the most emotional opening statements that I've ever heard, including a chilling 13 minute video timeline of the insurrection and the role that Donald Trump played in that. Um, I I'm wondering how you, sitting there as a juror who also was a victim of the insurrection because you were there when it happened and you saw this develop live, um, how effective was the video, for example, in reminding your fellow senators of what happened on January 6th? That's a great question, Joe. And you know, as a very experienced trial lawyer that images, photographs, visual exhibits or evidence can have an extraordinary impact. And this one, all the more so because we lived through it, but we never saw the experience in total on a timeline. And we never saw up close for example, the beating of police officers. Some of these scenes were so graphic. And the pounding of windows, breaking of doors with an American flag, the kind of ransacking of the Senate chamber where we were sitting yesterday. And then the president, two hours after this assault on our democracy began, doing a video where he said that they were very special people, his words, that they should go in peace, that it was a historic day. And 
in effect reveling in what they did. And of course the tweet that he issued saying, this is what happens when you steal an election from me. The overall impact was really so powerful and I think transformative. I, there was complete silence at the end of it. Mm. So could you I, see, I think it was really very, very impactful. Could you see any of your particularly Republican colleagues reacting? Could you tell whether it had the same impact on them that it did on you, Victor, me, um, and, and much of the national audience, I would say? I saw some were plainly spellbound. Mm. It was the kind of thing that you couldn't turn away from if you really wanted to learn. There were others who I could tell were looking at the floor, looking at their shoes, looking away because they simply didn't want to face it. So I think it was a mixed reaction on their part. And I will say, whether they see it on the floor of the Senate or in some other setting, they will have to face it. They can't wish it away. They can't turn away from it, nor can the American people. You mentioned some particular scenes, and there are a couple that I have wondered about um, when you talk about the Capitol Police and how they were overwhelmed. There is one scene of an officer being squeezed in the door and writhing in pain, and you can hear it in his voice. Is he all right? Do you happen to know who that is and if he's okay? I think he's okay. I believe he was injured. You know, the injuries here were very severe. Concussions, broken backs, uh, the loss of an eye. Obviously, there was one death directly related to it, two suicides uh, among Capitol Police, the stabbings and other kinds of physical injuries affected more than 140 officers. But I'll tell you also what struck me is the, the shout, which you heard partway through as they were running through the halls, where are they? meaning where are the congressmen? They were looking for us. And another figure who says, storm your state capital. We're yeah. dealing here, Jill, with a phenomenon that is truly horrifying, the rise of domestic terrorism in the United States. Clearly, Donald Trump invited and implored this group to come to the Capitol. He ignited and fueled the flame that brought them to storm the Capitol and try to stop the vote counting and retain power for himself. But he was summoning domestic terrorists, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, Boogaloo. These groups are a core of domestic terrorism that is one of the latest national terrorism bulletins calls the most persistent and lethal threat, national security threat to our democracy. So there is a broader danger here that I hope the American public will see and take very seriously. How did you feel when you saw the video of them going through your desks? Was that something that was extremely disturbing to you? I'm not sure whether they went through my desk, but yeah. we were sitting in the chamber where they went through desks. I was trying to identify which they were. I think the invasion of our chamber, yeah. somebody sitting in the dais, you know, uh, nobody's allowed to sit at the dais except for the presiding officer, no one. And for them to be mocking and demeaning the dignity and majesty of the chambers about more than just the physical place, about our democracy. It's as if you went into a church to the pulpit or you know, other sacred parts of the church and mock them. Yeah. It's in a sense, the citadel of our democracy in the chamber of the House and the Senate 
are the two central parts of it. So I, I don't want to kind of exaggerate, right. but it, it struck me more that they were just roaming free and desecrating the entire chamber, more important than, than our notes uh, or uh, possession. Now, as, as riveting and emotional as the video was and the arguments of the house managers, um, what do you think about having witnesses? It seems that the Schumer-McConnell negotiations have excluded the possibility of live witnesses uh, in exchange for getting the trial to be very fast and short. Um, so I have two questions from that. One is, you know, how important is it that it be speedy? And do you think that witnesses would help to communicate to the American people and to your fellow senators exactly what happened and why it's important to hold Donald Trump accountable, why he is accountable, uh, why he's responsible for it, and why he should be held accountable? Here's my mantra about witnesses, and it will, I think, resonate with you as an experienced trial lawyer. The, the trial lawyers, the prosecutors, whoever's trying the case has to be the one to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And as you know, a judge will allow a trial lawyer a good deal of discretion, not to be repetitive, but a trial lawyer has to try her or his own case. And that's my approach here. The house manager should be allowed to call witnesses. Frankly, so should the defense if they feel it is necessary and appropriate to their case. They can't run on indefinitely like a judge. I would uh, demand to know relevance, probative value, prejudicial impact, all that stuff. And so I think if they want witnesses, so be it. Now, the witnesses wouldn't take a lot of time, I don't think, you know, maybe a day or two extra. But mm -hmm. keep in mind the need to move forward with the COVID relief package is overwhelming. That's our first priority to provide vaccines, make more of them, deliver more of them, make them more readily available to people of all ages and especially the frontline workers, but also economic aid and rental assistance, nutritional aid, of course, unemployment compensation and the stimulus payments of $2,000. This big, comprehensive, bold, robust program has to be finalized. I think it will be by the end of February. And we are working on it even as we try this case. In fact, we begin midday, noon, we go until eight or nine in the evening, our staffs are working while we're in the chamber and we're working directly on it before we go into the trial. The house is working full time on it. So we're doing both and we're doing them at the same time, which brings me to the final point. We can allow for those witnesses and still conclude in a very timely manner. Uh, the whole trial should be at most a week, maybe a few days more, we're going to work through the weekend, Saturday, and I hope Sunday, and we'll bring it to a conclusion. The American people deserve to see all this evidence. And I would just say this about witnesses. I don't know of a witness who can use words, any words, to describe what I saw in this video, more graphically, more powerfully, more movingly, heartbreakingly, gut-wrenchingly, than what we saw with our own eyes. And so I'm sort of thinking at this point, witnesses might add something about what happened, let's say in the White House, where there's no video, or in other places where there's no direct evidence, but we'll see what the House managers have and what they wanna present. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, I certainly agree. I, there are some witnesses I'd love to see and some investigation that I hope that the Senate will continue even after the verdict in this case. Um, but some is relevant to the trial, like the January 5th meeting, which we haven't seen. We've 
read about uh, the meeting in Trump Hotel with his sons and Navarro and Flynn and organizers, and also witnesses about the funding of this rally. Um, that might be persuasive, um, but I, I know Victor has some questions, so let's let's let him get going. Yeah, just to circle back to what we saw yesterday, um, you know, after Representative uh, Raskin's opening remarks, um, House impeachment managers uh, Joe Negus and David Cicilline, who were both brilliant, uh, they analyzed the language, history, and precedent of uh, impeachment in America. And I think what was striking to me in both the House impeachment managers' written brief and opening argument was just how much they relied on um, an analytic method which conservative espouse originalism and textualism, which is, you know, for our audience listening, um, basically interpreting the Constitution how the framers would have. Do you think referencing that conservative method of interpretation is an effective way to reach Republican senators like Cruz and Hawley, who are fierce advocates for textualism and originalism? I think it would be if they had an open mind. <laughs> Yeah. I don't think Cruz and Hawley are going to vote for conviction. They didn't vote yeah. for jurisdiction. And uh, as I said to uh, maybe I think both of you at the very outset, we're dealing here with a jury composed of people who would have been struck, mm -hmm. that is rejected by uh, the judge himself for being prejudiced, for having views that they couldn't shape. And we're not dealing here with a normal jury. In fact, I wouldn't be talking to you right. if I were the normal <laughs> juror about what was going on in the case. So I think you're absolutely right. You make a very good point that we're relying on a reading of the Constitution, a common sense reading of the original language. The language says that all impeachment shall be tried, not just all impeachments of sitting officials, public officials who are in office, but all impeachment have to be tried by the Senate. We have a constitutional duty here. We can't walk away from it. We could be accused of shirking that duty. In fact, I can't be responsible for the Cruz and Hawleys of the world. I have to make my own decisions based on my own oath. Donald Trump violated his oath. That's the fundamental crux of this impeachment. He violated his oath to protect and defend the Constitution, not just in inciting the crowd, but failing to protect the Constitution, the vote counting, the Capitol, after the assault was underway. He violated his oath. If my Republican colleagues obey their oath, they'll vote to convict, they'll follow the facts and law. But I can't be responsible under the written language of the Constitution for their interpretation. I will just make one other point here. Uh, Jill asked about the January 5th meeting. Well, I think that this case has to go back and put this entire January 6th assault on the Capitol in the context of Donald Trump's 77 day campaign to overthrow the election, his pressure on Georgia officials, his attempt to persuade the Wayne County Michigan mm -hmm. election commissioners to reject the outcome. His constantly threatening, even before the election, that the only way he would lose is if it were rigged. And this January 6th violent insurrection was the natural culmination. It was the last fiery assault in that 77 day campaign to overthrow an election and keep himself in power. In effect, the founders' worst nightmare, what they feared most was a demagogue who would use physical force to keep himself in power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, you know, you mentioned, you know, Ted Cruz and, and Josh Hawley and how, you know, you aren't responsible for how they're going to vote. But is there anything that you would tell your Republican colleagues about the need to vote yes and about the stakes of this impeachment trial, um, not just for my generation, but for aspiring lawyers and anyone who's watching this, that Trump is guilty and he did incite an insurrection? Is there anything that you think will change their minds? I think one of the lessons for all generations is the need for moral compass, for conviction, 
and conscience. What we're facing here really is a moment of reckoning. It's a moral reckoning for my colleagues and history will judge them. You'll judge them, not only right now, but in the future, they're going to be outlived by people who are watching right now. And that living history right now before your eyes, I think should be the basis for your judgments. I would hope that your generation, my children's generation, all of us will take a lesson about the need for stronger moral topics as a result of their shirking their duty. Because the only reason that they would vote not to convict here is cowardice and spinelessness. Not surprising because cowardice and spinelessness is what they've shown for the last four years in the face of Donald Trump's consistent, repeated, constant violation of law, breaking of norms, his self-enrichment, his obstruction of justice, his family separation policy at the border. I could use the next 15 minutes to go through <laughs> all of them, uh, not, not with any great pride or pleasure, mm -hmm. but actually deep sadness and outrage that we have a president who has such contempt for the law. I have two last questions if if um, we can impose on your time for just a bit longer. Sure. And one of them is um, before we started recording, we were having a very interesting conversation about our impressions of the first day of the uh, trial and the house manager's presentation as compared to the defense presentation. And if you could make some comments on that, that would be my first question. And then my second is, we're expecting some new evidence today. Um, do you have any idea what that evidence is? What's your guess? Uh, I have no idea what the new evidence is. I'll be very interested to see it. I can make a couple of guesses, but I could be as wrong as anyone. And I suspect they may involve what happened after the beginning of the onslaught, as I've mentioned, what happened in the White House, maybe what happened in terms of uh, Trump's failure to lift a finger when his own vice president was threatened with assassination, his, his utter and total lack of caring about what was happening, the danger, physical danger, which is already apparent from that video, from his tweets, and other evidence already in the record. But let me just say, Jill, and I hope you appreciate this point, uh, as, a, as a trial attorney, my worst nightmare as a prosecutor, or one of them, was incompetent counsel on the other side. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, people imagine, you know, you want incompetent counsel mm -hmm. if you're a prosecutor. No, you don't really, because First of all, incompetent counsel is a potential uh, appeal issue, but more to the point, issues are created on appeal, mistakes are made, the judge begins sympathizing with yes. the defendant because <laughs> his own lawyer isn't doing a good job and so the judge feels he has to compensate. I think our justice system is best served when you have a real, honest, vigorous, Yes. and skilled contents. And I hope we'll have it here. The, the incompetence of the council so far really verged on malpractice. Yeah. And rather than making fun of them, I sort of feel very regretful that they're not doing a better job. I will say the house managers are superbly prepared. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they are avoiding so far repetition and exaggeration. They're relying, as Victor pointed out, on the text of the Constitution. They're being very careful in the way they characterize statements made by the president or others. And I think we'll continue to see that professionalism. I hope we see professionalism on the other side as well. 
Yeah. As a nonpartisan comment, I would say as a trial lawyer who has seen lawyers of all stripes, the House managers were brilliant. They made the Constitution an emotional subject. They showed why adherence to it matters. Um, and I, I wouldn't go so far as to say they were incompetent because uh, on the defense side, and with all the resources that the president, former president, has, um, he's certainly entitled to pick who he wants to represent himself. Um, but I agree completely with what you said. You do not want a bad defense. You want people on the other side who can make the case as best they can. But let me just say that um, Jim Neal, who was the senior trial attorney on the Watergate case, uh, said, there are some cases you just can't win. The facts are against you, the law is against you, and even if you're Clarence Darrow, you aren't gonna win. Mm -hmm. And this may be one of those cases that Clarence Darrow couldn't defend because there's no facts to defend, and the law is so clearly um, on the side of prosecution and conviction. Um, the, irony, the irony, Jill, is that this case, they really can't lose. In other words, getting to two thirds is going to be very, very difficult for the House managers. But, but not still, on the law, not on the facts, only on politics. Exactly, exactly. And, and coming to sort of what I hope the message is here, and Victor raised this very aptly, this trial has a purpose beyond just the yes. verdict. Mm -hmm. It is educating the public you know and i know that acquittals sometimes can have a powerful impact on the individual involved and on public consciousness especially when it's a public corruption trial i've seen acquittals where the evidence presented created a record it affected people's view of their local or state governments in a way that really was vitally impactful it shook up the local officials and frankly Donald Trump may not be convicted by the United States Senate, but he'll be convicted by history. And this evidence will be really powerful in that sort of I totally agree. And I think for, for many of my peers who were totally uninterested in law and politics, they were watching yesterday and they were just blown away by the House impeachment managers. And I just think for my generation, it's important to kind of send that message that accountability does matter and that good governance yes. is going to, you know, triumph at the end of the day. Um, but as you said at the beginning of the podcast, you know, uh, you're doing uh, two things at once, which is you're holding Trump accountable and you're also um, uh, passing this, uh, the solutions and uh, legislation that the American people expect from the Congress. And I just want to end the podcast by talking about an, an issue that I know is uh, near and dear to your heart, which is gun violence prevention. Um, with last week being Gun Violence Survivors Week and the anniversary of the Parkland um, shooting coming up on Sunday, what do you aim to, uh, to do to combat that issue in this Congress? And what can young activists um, play in the gun violence prevention movement? Uh, young activists have been the wind beneath our sails. They've been the lifeblood of this physical and political movement that we've created. The March for Our Lives, the young people from Sandy Hook, from all over the country whom I have met have really fueled our movement. They've inspired me and others, even though I've been involved in this effort for probably now about three decades when I began as, as, as Attorney General of the state of Connecticut and we passed the assault weapon ban there and I defended it in court. We now have a real political movement as a result of young people who have joined Students Demand Action, they've supported Moms Demand Action, Brady and Giffords, uh, Every Town, Sandy Hook Promise, uh, Newtown Action Alliance. These groups are now a powerhouse politically. And so I am anticipating we will move forward mm -hmm. on common sense steps mm -hmm. to prevent gun violence. Universal background check, emergency risk protection orders. These measures prevent dangerous people from buying guns or they take guns away from people who are dangerous to themselves or others. Safe storage laws, Ethan's law, mm -hmm. domestic violence laws that 
again, tighten the laws, to taking away guns from people who commit domestic violence, closing the Charleston loophole, maybe even a ban on assault weapons. But these common sense steps, I think, are achievable now. With a Democratic president who's committed to gun violence prevention, Joe Biden was President Obama's partner in campaigning and working for this cause. We have a Democratic House and the Senate, both committed to achieving the kinds of measures that are possible, not expecting all of those measures to be passed. But even as we debate impeachment and this trial, people are continuing to perish on our streets, in our communities, by the drive-by shootings, by suicide. This scourge is continuing. It's an epidemic of gun violence. It's gotten worse during the pandemic because of social isolation and the stresses and strains and anxieties that the pandemic has imposed. So I think this is a vital part of our agenda. And obviously we need to move forward on pandemic relief, putting America back to work, rebuilding our roads and bridges and other infrastructure. The challenges are immense. Gun violence prevention is certainly one of them. And I've already talked to a number of my colleagues about bipartisan action. I think it can be bipartisan to achieve these goals. For sure. And we hope to have you back to talk about all of those issues. But we know that you are about to start day two of uh, the impeachment trial, which is set to begin in just about 25 minutes. So we appreciate you spending some time with us and um, we hope to have you back sometime. I'd love to come back. Thank you for your very thoughtful questions. And I'm honored to be with you, Victor and Jill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator.